I've been hunting since before I can remember. It's in my blood, my bones. It's who I am. It's because of this pastime that I learned to cook, out of respect to both the eater and the eaten. On this episode, I head to California with Hank Shaw, who has an opposite but oddly similar story. Hank is a cook first, who learned to hunt late in life in order to develop a more intimate relationship with his ingredients. We're on my friend's ranch, a place with a few Columbia blacktails, a lot of wild pigs, and a handful of small game species, and we're hoping to obtain some fine, fresh, wild meat. I'm Steven Ronella. To me, hunting isn't only about the pursuit of an animal. It's about who we are and what we're made of. I live to hunt and hunt to live. I am a meat eater. Dove killing device. Hank Shaw and I have had a sort of professional admiration for one another going back years. And after a chance meeting last year, we decided to finally plan a trip together to hunt and cook. I made my way out to his end of the country, the hills of Northern California, to go after Columbia blacktail deer, wild pigs, and some small game. My original interest in being friends with Hank started when he reached out to me years ago. I was impressed with him as a wild game chef who had a great blog, Hunter, Angler, Gardener, Cook. Striking up a friendship with the guy seemed like a surefire way to pick up some great techniques and recipes that I could use. Now, Hank, I'm gonna tell you, I don't think I've ever actually seen a deer on this property. They're saying this is a gimme hunt. <laughs> but the thing I will tell you is this place is crawling with wild bears. We're set up for a morning glassing session, situated on a hill where we can bounce back and forth under a little bit of cover with good views of the surrounding hills. Oh, I got a, I got a lone, fat little pig, man, oh, yeah. up in the tree line. Yeah, I see him. Pigs can be found all over this ranch. But the more elusive thing to find, and what we're really hoping to see, are some Columbia blacktail deer. Oh, I got a pack of deer. Do you? Yeah. Where are they at? Three of them. I'll be damned, I see them. Nice spotting, Tex. Thanks. <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> there are four deer, actually, on that bench. Are there? There's a, nice, there's a buck in there. Hey, yeah? Sweet. Two bucks. Is it the two in the shadow? The two that are fighting? Yep. Oh yeah, I see antlers. An encouraging sign. And not just a couple does either. There's at least one legitimate buck out there. There's no catching these deer now that they're heading into thick bedding cover. But at least we've got a mark for where we can expect to see them later on. We'll have to wait till evening before we have a chance to glass up some more deer. Well, I think for now, we'll just start picking our way back toward camp and then, um, if we really put a lot of work into it and hunt really hard, I think we might be able to work up a jackrabbit. Oh, I don't know. I'm, I'm not above shooting jacks with a 270. <laughs> you aim a little high, I'm assuming. I'm, I'm an expert at killing jackrabbits with large caliber rifles. <laughs> this time of year, just for sanity's sake, you got to have something else to hunt during the midday doldrums. So before the sun gets to its most brutal stage, we decide to split up and see if we can rustle up some small game. Dove season is open, it's quail season for bow. We could also work up a jackrabbit. There's lots of possibilities. No matter what happens and who shoots it, Hank's cooking it. I'm never happier than when I'm walking around with my shotgun. I think it's just because I don't big game hunt enough, where I don't feel at peace and at ease the way I do when I'm shotgunning. Jackrabbit. Oh, sitting there laughing at me right now. <laughs> oh well, rabbits won me nothing.
Sorry, Mr. Jack, but you're gonna be lunch. It's a young jackrabbit, because he's very small. These can get twice the size, but young is tender. So the stew that I make with this is from Sardinia. Basically, it's super simple. It's got capers and saffron and onions, and yeah, I brought capers and saffron to the to the <laughs> camping site because I, I kind of thought we might get a jackrabbit, so. Now, jackrabbits are not generally considered to be good eating, but Hank's known for cooking critters that most people ignore and then turning them into mind-blowing meals. I'm excited to see how his stewed jack is going to stand up to the animal's general reputation. Our first day on the ranch has been rich. Right off the bat, we spotted both deer and pigs, and Hank already put some meat in the cooler. In the evening, we head out to re-find the buck that we saw this morning. We set up where we should be much closer in order to make a stalk, but the buck never shows. We do see a few more deer scattered on distant hills, but the closer ones are does. As for the farther ones, in the waning light, it's impossible to tell if they're carrying antlers or not. Tomorrow's another day. But one thing's clear. If we want to catch these deer out feeding tomorrow morning, this is the place to be. At first light, we're set up exactly where we should be. Things just feel right. I got two deer over here. Oh, yeah. They're headed up that slope, but they probably would go down getting water at night. He's got way for our buck to make his spirits. Oh, I see him. Right. Uh, it's another deer. Oh, yeah, that's the best buck. There you go. How far is that? 475. He's out there. A responsible hunter, Hank knows his maximum effective range, and he doesn't even feel tempted to risk a shot he's got no business taking. We plan a stalk to get a little closer. I feel fairly certain that the buck will follow the same route toward his bedding area that he used the day before, and I get Hank set up to intercept him. Just go. I creep up. Yeah. Just lay down in there. Just wait. Hopefully he'll do that same thing he did yesterday. Yeah. All right, I'll see you in a little bit. All right. I get Hank all set at the edge of the opening, and I back out. I don't want to crowd this deer. I want to give him every advantage. But as soon as I back away, I spot another buck. He's about a mile away, and I decide to make a move. This landscape is not making it easy. The steep angles of the hill, the brush, and shifting uphill winds all combine to make this a very difficult approach. I don't think we made it up here in time. Oh, 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 oh. position. I was looking up there, and they must have snaggled the way back down. And being a left-handed, oh, man. <laughs> it's like the amateur hour here. Here on amateur hour television. I think Steve might have just got one. One shot is usually a good sign. Okay. <laughs> Sweet. This is the first 
Columbia blacktail I've ever laid hands on. <laughs> and these deer are interesting because like I've hunted Sitka blacktails, now I've hunted Columbia blacktails, I've hunted mule deer. What they think now with modern genetics work is mule deer are, are, are kind of a brand new species in a historical sense. You know, maybe like around the time humans arrived in the new world, like that's all the older mule deer are. And they think that it was the result of hybridization between black-tailed bucks and white-tailed does when white-tails had, had a more western range. And you know, two attacks on them, it's like mule deer and black-tails are kind of lumped together. They just have an arbitrary, the I-5, Interstate 5 in California. Everything west of that is regarded as a Columbia blacktail. Everything east of that is regarded as a mule deer. But this guy could cross that corridor and he would become, for hunting purposes, he would all of a sudden be a mule deer. Same deer. Look at a nice little summer coat. It's blazing hot, so I'm gonna get this guy in the shade for now before I start working on him. Hank just keeps waiting. He found a perfect spot, hidden behind a rock, wind roaring into his face but the deer never show. Deer two mean nothing. I shot this buck straight on through the heart. A good, strong, lethal hit, but I'm suspicious the bullet punctured some other internal organs as well, and his insides are likely a mess now. In this case, it's best to go with what's called the gutless method, which leaves the inner organ lining intact. The downside of that is it's hot, you know, so you want to work fast because those things are, they're not, they're not getting any fresher in there. I do my belly incision without cutting into the cavity and then remove one side of the hide just like pulling over a winter blanket. Working on just this side, you can remove the back ham, the shoulder, the neck, and take the back strap out. And even though I haven't gutted it, gravity is pulling the insides down and there's just enough space to remove the rib meat without disturbing the innards. There's a big bot fly larva that was in his nasal cavity. That is a vicious parasite to carry around right there. Can you imagine living with that? I mean, it's not as bad as getting shot in skin, but it's gotta be pretty bad. Lunchtime. One of Hank's favorites, Sardinian hare stew. Hank has promised to make a jackrabbit believer out of me, and I have to admit a small degree of skepticism. I've eaten quite a few jacks, but I've never found a way to make them something you'd want to share with anyone besides your enemies. So what I got so far is I, I broke them up into serving pieces. I've cooked it in some olive oil with a couple of onions. And that's it so far? That's it so far. I'm gonna throw in some garlic and uh, capers. It's a water-based stew. You don't add chicken stock or any broth. And you see how there's already a sauce on this? I mean, it's already nice and brown. After the last touches of saffron, some wild California bay leaves, and a chili or two, you leave it to simmer. You have to braise it, yeah. or you have to stew it. You can't chicken fry a hair. After an hour and a quarter, the meat will be falling off the bone. Hank finishes it off with some red wine vinegar made with grapes from his own backyard. So really, it's like a soup almost. Like it's pretty, it's thin. Mm -hmm. The broth is kind of the star. Yeah, for sure. That's ridiculous, man. Super simple. Yeah. All it asks of you is time. That's one of the better things I've had in a long time, actually. I'm not just saying that either. Some animals may be trickier than others to figure out how to cook properly. But with each and every animal, there's at least one way to be found to cook it right. As far as I'm concerned, this is it for the jackrabbit. With bellies full of stew, it's time to get back out and see if we can get ourselves some wild pork. We've seen plenty of pigs while glassing for deer, but pigs can be tricky. A family group of pigs, known as a sounder, will often have multiple spots they like to bed down and multiple spots they use for water. Hank and I decided to set up in different areas where we saw pigs yesterday, but it's far from certain that they'll be there today. Come on, pigs. Show yourselves. 
at least give us a chance here. Hank heads across the stream and part way up the opposing ridge. I'm headed down to a grove of oaks in the valley floor. Sure enough, it's not long before I spot a sow and a bunch of youngsters making their way toward the shelter of the tree line. Right now we got a down valley breeze, but it's gonna quickly become an up valley breeze. Pigs have a good sense of smell, so I just gotta try and stay downwind as best as I can. Everything seems perfect, but suddenly something happens and they start to move out in a hurry. started running like they were getting spooked a little bit. There we go. We got another pig coming our way. This one was running. I shot him in the head, you know, to lead him a little bit. So in order to make sure he gets bled out right, I'm gonna cut his juggler. Hank, on the other hand, is just not spotting any pigs. He's coming up empty. Just heard a shot. I think Steve got me again. No, I got some work cut out for me now. It's blazing hot out. So first priority is to get these pigs in the shade and roll the guts out. That was a pretty productive morning, man. We laid by, I mean, <laughs> laid by a lot of meat. I've got both pigs tagged into the shade and gutted, but it's a lot to move. Since there's a ranch road not too far off, I decide to head to camp and meet up with Hank. Then we'll bring the truck down and take care of the rest of the skinning back at camp. Hauling two of these big pigs 100 or so yards to the truck sure beats hiking both of these guys out of here on my back. I'm bummed that I was never able to get Hank on the trigger for a buck or a pig, but I'm still looking forward to sitting back and watching a master cook. Hank was able to take down only a young jackrabbit this trip, but I didn't bring him out here for his own enjoyment. He's here to give me some new ideas on cooking wild game. Hank's gonna show me one of his most versatile wild game stews using our buck. While that cooks, he's got a pig heart dish that's a variation on the classic German Jager schnitzel. But first, the venison stew. This dish is by far one of my favorite dishes to do with anything, and it's, it's, it's called chilindron. It's a Spanish dish. You can't rush this step. This is one of the most important things, especially if you're going to do a stew. Don't crowd the pan. Just take your time. You get a nice brown, and you get all of this good stuff in the pan. Hank browns the meat and then uses some homemade wine to deglaze the pot. All that charred brown stuff scraped off the bottom is going to add a ton of flavor to the stew. Building a stew is, is basically you're building like a house. And we've just built the foundation. And now everything sort of gets built up around it. The blend of spices is what makes Chilindron what it is. Smoked paprika, a heaping amount of regular paprika, and then Hank's special blend of rehydrated Mexican chilies. Next, some game stock. This made from smoked goose. Then the last couple touches, some white sage and California bay leaves. But this is, that's it. I mean, we just let this go until the venison that's it. falls to pieces. That's a lot, man. In the meantime, we set to work on that pig heart. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna clean this up and I'm gonna make it into a, you know, like a schnitzel or a cutlet. And what you're gonna do is you're gonna cut around so you can kind of open it up like a book. You take this veiny stuff off, just pretty it up. 
because the point here is actually to make a piece of meat that somebody who might be scared of eating hard, uh, they'll like it. They're like, oh, it was so good. Next step, pound the meat flat. And this. That's the acorn flour? That's the acorn flour. I just like to add a little bit of a wild touch to it, because these, these pigs eat acorns. Probably shot them under an acorn tree. <laughs> He's about ready to go under one. Exactly. Now we fry. A traditional German Jaeger schnitzel originated with venison. Oh, yeah, hunter schnitzel. Mm hmm. And these are done. A simple sauce of rehydrated morels and some onions. It's really, it's camp food. You know, it's kind of appropriate for where we are. In my first camp trip, Hank. Look at that. <laughs> Look at that. <laughs> that heart was just tender. That big old boar is good, man. He's all right. Yeah. Three hours later, the chillin' drone is ready. Red food is always good, you know what I mean? And this is this king of red food. Again, man, that's tasty. But this is a good use of your deer, man. I'm sorry I didn't get one. I just seem to be in the wrong place at the wrong time, the whole time. No, I was out there having good luck, you are out there having bad luck. Yeah, you know, the gray buck that we saw, you know, it's... Who still has no idea we were trying to kill him. Exactly. <laughs> in your mind, you're already making chillin' drone out of him. But I'll tell you, you changed my mind, like, what I considered to be an educated dismissal of the jackrabbit, <laughs> and I, now I'm gonna go in and adjust that. Thank you. I'm gonna revisit the idea of jackrabbits. <laughs>